hello from our side as well and welcome to the presentation on privacy on in practice my colleague as mentioned marcus and i we will present the interactive virtual assistant eva as a way of enhancing privacy literacy both of us are part of the project bird at nfti which is a uh, consortium for business economic and related data and also part of the German national research data infrastructure. We focus on unstructured data in economics and as also in social sciences. And we are currently developing a platform with various um, data relevant services. We hope to help and support researchers. And that is why we'll be offering on our platform various information, materials, trainings, workshops, tools, and other data related services. And in all of this, we see that data protection is highly relevant uh, externally and internally. And we face the question, how can we deal with its challenges in practice? This is also one of the main questions which moved us to develop EVA. Going to the start uh, of the development process in the background as a first step, we looked at the data protection laws and regulations, and as you can see, there is no shortage of information on data protection laws. We have the GDPR in Europe, and for example, in Germany, there is also the German national data protection law, as well as 16 different federal state data protection laws, many special laws, as well as other opinions, recommendations, essays, and so on. So the problem here is not a lack of information, but the accessibility and, of course, the preparation and the need for prior knowledge needed before. So keyword here would be the efficient information presentation or maybe the lack thereof. And how can researchers deal with this? Well, we see three different options for the time being. Researchers can either ignore the legal developments and carry on as before. They can avoid risky research areas relevant to data protection, or a third way, maybe they can comply with data protection and conduct research in accordance with the regulations. Of course, our three paths have also some disadvantages and consequences. For example, if you choose the first one, research becomes illegitimate by turning away from the law. If you choose to avoid risky research area, research is thus limited. And if you choose to comply with data protection and conduct research in accordance with the law, um, at the very least, there are considerable resources like time, work, and money that are spent on checking legality and on the administration. Nevertheless, we can say with certainty that we would definitely choose the third way, which is to comply with the law, but the related problems should be solved. So the problems of the resources should definitely be solved. How? Well, for example, by developing a tool called EVA. At this point, we must ask ourselves, why do we need such a tool? So why do we need a data protection assistant? And what does, the, what does the tool need to be able to do? What are the goals? Well, first and foremost, our goal is to promote data protection compliance in research. But at the same time, this should take as little as time as possible. All this should be achieved through the efficient provision of information. And in order to get there, we have to look at the source. Going back to the many data protection laws and regulations, it is um, here important to process the existing information in such a way that the target group can absorb it and can also apply it. And here speaking of the target group, we mean uh, scientific researchers and data scientists. So we ask ourselves which rules and laws are relevant. Well, from the multitude of norms, we had to filter out those relevant specifically to research. And after these preliminary considerations, we come to our first work result and the first step of the development process of EVA, which is this extensive Excel sheet. This is also the first 
categorization attempt done by my former colleague, Las Obalenda, who was also the legal counsel at the previous project, BERT at BW. So in 2019, he first had to familiarize himself with the legal system with the hierarchy of the legal sources of data protection. Then some analysis was done. Um, all sorts of norms of GDPR were categorized. And in the columns here, although it's in German, you can maybe see there is a address C column, a column with the different facts, and also with the legal consequences. So to sum up, one had to find, read, and filter many applicable norms for research and process them. And the result is a list of all GDPR norms categorized according to relevance and references to potentially other relevant norms of other laws. This categorized list of applicable norms was used as a basis for developing a, another document, a legal assessment. Um, this Legal assessment is a structured legal text giving researchers an answer to one question. And in our case, the question is, what am I allowed to do with the data? So the structure of the assessment was first developed on the basis of the facts and legal consequences of the norms. This included various criteria formulated as questions, and the text was then enriched with information such as definitions, which were necessary for answering those questions. For this, there was legal argumentation, argumentation that was developed and formulated, and in the process, some legal uncertainties and problems had to be resolved. As a result, we have a thorough but bundled legal assessment on the legality of data processing. But is this an efficient way to provide information for researchers and non-experts? Well, on the one hand, legal assessment has indeed bundled information, but is still much too complex and also inconvenient for non-experts. That is why a further attempt to reduce the complexity was made. And with this, we come to the decision tree. So here, parts of the legal assessment were presented as a tree structure by reformulating all assessment points into binary questions and graphically presenting the legal consequences as paths and result fields. So the assessment structure was thus presented more clearly, and researchers can now identify and understand which information is important to answer the main question. Here on the right, you see the decision tree for our first EVA module, or EVA 1, which tackles the question of the GDPR applicability and has only two possible outcomes at the end. So GDPR is either applicable or it's not. With this, we are newly at the end of the development process and wrap it up in a short overview. From the multitude of norms of data protection laws here, we have come to our first attempt for efficient information presentation, which is the um, extensive Excel sheet. Then we have the legal assessment, which is a structured legal text. And after this, we came to the decision tree. And at the end, we have EVA, our final result. You'll see here only a small preview of the two. And now my colleague Marcus will show you how we came from these steps in the decision tree to the final version and book of EVA. Yes, thank you, Vasilka. So from those previous steps of preparing information, we distilled the essence of what we were looking for. So we wanted to follow the structure, the binary structure of the decision tree, but also include the information which is needed to navigate through it for users which don't have the legal background. Um, and all this, we wanted to put an interactive object so that we can provide the information where it's needed the most and where the user can use it on demand. So this was the initial concept of EVA, which was born in that moment and in this uh, equation. And we really wanted to design it for the users, such as researchers or other people working um, with data, which also posed several requirements. Um, so first and foremost, the legal terms must be understandable without the legal knowledge, as already mentioned. But we also tried to address users and their data as directly as possible, so they're better able to relate to it. 
Um, we also try to avoid to overload with any information because all the regulations out there and all the information and context with, uh, which Basilica already showed is already some kind of information overload. So we try to reduce it to the relevant snippets and present them step by step in smaller pieces to be in, e easier to digest. Um, users are also supposed to find this sequence and comprehensive information in a forward manner. So they don't stumble over too many compon components or too much going on on the screen, but that they know where to find what in which moment. We also wanted the object to end with an actual result that users can work with and not just some abstract definitions or analogous gizms. Um, and we wanted this end result also to be comprehensible. So not only the result itself, in this case of EVA1, if the GDPR applies or not, but also a way for users to see what questions and answers made them arrive to this result. All these user requirements, which we defined also implied some considerations for how to developing this tool. Um, and because we really wanted to focus on the content and how to formulate and sequence the information, we were mainly considering using an existing open source toolkit instead of developing it completely on our own, which of course is also a matter of resources. We were also aiming for a balance of having a graphical interface while still needing some options of customizations. So we landed with the open source toolkit Xerti, which comes already with a dedicated decision tree module. And having this dedicated toolkit uh, specializes on decision tree helped us also greatly in transforming all the information we had and the knowledge of what information we wanted to be there in the object um, into that object. But yeah, of course, all these requirements and background, we want to especially show uh, you how Eva looks like and how it works. So first you get greeted uh, by an introduction page which sets the tone, um, tells you what Eva is and what isn't, and also which answers it tries to tackle. Um, then it's followed by an information um, on the navigation. So users know what to expect and where to find um, what in the assistant. So in the end, they can focus better on the contents. This also brings us to the main screens. Um, this is an example of basically how every step of the decision tree looks like in structure. As mentioned before, we were aiming for repetition so that people are not confused or distracted by changing components or elements, but that they find the same kind of information in the same place. It always starts with um, a header, which is the criterion, which is examined in this step and is followed by, very importantly, an explanation to give context information on how to answer the question, which is the big difference to only having the decision tree to have this explanation and having the context on answering the question, which brings you to the next step of the decision tree. The actual question itself also highlights the criterion, which is excellent. And we have usually two answer options, which are yes or no. But sometimes we have um, an I'm not sure option, which sequences um, more complex questions into different parts in hoping that users find it easier to answer smaller parts of this question than the question as a whole. On some pages, you will also find a more information button, um, which is not necessarily uh, necessary to answer the question as is the explanation before, but it also helps you to dive deeper if you want to. On the left side, you will find a table of contents or outline, um, which is based on the structured legal assessment, which was done earlier. And that way users can also get a sense of the structure of the decision tree and see where they are in there. If you have clicked through all your questions on your path through the decision tree, you will find an end result screen, which either tells you in this case, if the GDPR applies or not. But it also shows you an overview um, of the path you took through the assistant. So which criterions uh, were posed, which answer options were given, and what you have selected in there. So you also get a sense what you went through and uh, what led to the decision you found in the end. Further, it also provides you with an easy to copy version, which was also important for us because we wanted it to be something to be worked with. So people can copy this, um, save it and look through it again, but especially also take it um, as some kind of pre-assessment and discuss further issues and questions with the responsible data protection officers um, and yeah, the people who are related to that. 
So all those examples are from um, EVA1, where we tackle the question of um, the applicability of the GDPR, but um, the full scope of EVA also includes EVA2, which um, asks the question, if I can base my data processing on consent, or EVA3, which will release soon, um, about other legal bases if I cannot rely on consent as the legal basis. And with all these um, three EVA modules, um, we want to highlight the question of, is privacy law for data users non-transparent and incomprehensible? And we really hope that our presentation and EVA itself could point the answer towards not necessarily. And with this, we also would like to end with the thought of that um, this should also point in the direction of that we should keep working on ways to present privacy regulations in a manner which is understandable and hopefully even a bit fun. And yeah, we hope we you go ahead and try Eva right now or possibly after the event. But for now, we look very much forward to your questions and comments. Thank you both, uh, Markus and Vasilika. This is a fantastic uh, piece of infrastructure you created there. Um, I, I see a lot of excitement in the rooms and in clapping hands flying through the screen. Um, one question that I'm asking myself and we see here posted by uh, Jennifer Park um, is whether EVA itself is open source and can uh, this be used as a template and adapted to for other countries or, you know, in, in the US, as we discussed or heard earlier, you know, the, the movements on sort of having GDPR-like uh, policies that maybe can build upon what, what you started. So maybe you can say a few words to, to that part. Yeah, that's the plan, I think, was always in the whole development of EVA as a method to uh, provide information. And yeah, we went just ahead and tried it with this tool we used, um, but we're still looking in ways how to best share what we did. It means all the information, which um, also to present the decision trees, um, to work with them, but also the code behind EVA or the object itself, except itself is open source, so anyone can use it um, also on their own PCs or on servers. Um, but we really try to yeah, portray this soon, as soon as we have finished our current EVAs. Great. Maybe. And then let me, oh, sorry, go ahead. Masilika. Just to quickly add to that, currently EVA has a license CC BY. So the information in the object itself are pretty much open. Excellent. That's that's great. Uh, last question for you guys. Um, do you have any information on acceptance users? I mean, we launched this very recently. And so maybe user base hasn't been that big yet, but I know that you did a couple of pilot tests. Uh, how is that working? And uh, can you speak to that? Yeah, um, we do this. We went more exploratory and <laughs> released it. Um, and now we look into how to yeah, see how people are working with it. We collect some data in the analytics part of the website. There's also um, the idea of tracking mouse movements anonymously to see which kind of paths people take if they use the more information button. And we also did some uh, usability tests in the um, eye tracking and mouse tracking laboratory in, in Mannheim. So all this is going on. Um, I would say in the whole open science in Germany, uh, we see a lot of acceptance and interest of definitely in the tool, but we still find ways to bring it to the researchers to actually use it uh, for what it's supposed to do. I guess that is a good uh, closing piece because I would translate into that, that into an invitation for anyone here to actually try next time you face such a decision, uh, the tool, and uh, please send Marcos and Vasilika uh, feedback on you know the usability whether this helped you in the process and and if not uh, any suggestions you might have how this tool can help you better 